there's a lot you can do in this town You set it up and turn it around We might have come from somewhere else But this is where we found ourselves Welcome to the local show People you work with, people you know Welcome to another edition of The Local Show here on Grassroots Community Network. Thank you for joining us, guys. I'm Eric Scarvin, your host. Still with the Olympic theme, guys. Here we got it going, U.S. ski team. Little memories from the Salt Lake City Olympics. And on that note, I'm so excited to welcome a first-time guest, fresh back from Beijing, Hannah Fallhaber. Did I say that right, Hannah? Yep, that was Hannah perfect. Fallhaber. Welcome to the show, Hannah. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure, my honor, and sharing the couch with Luna, oh, yeah. our co-host. Hi. Luna's back after a little hiatus. And, uh, yeah, welcome back, and congratulations on your Olympics. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a, it was a blast. Yeah, we're going to get into that today, of course, on the show, and just still feeling that, like, Olympic energy and spirit, and you guys inspired us so much uh, <laughs> here in Aspen, and we were so proud of you, and... Uh, but I wanted to just kind of start with kind of growing up in Aspen. You were on skis like at three years old, growing up here in the valley? Yeah, around like two and a half, three two years <laughs> old. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much since I could walk. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. And where did you first ski? Was that here at like one of the local mountains on Buttermilk or something? Or? Yeah, I, well, I'd say first time skiing was definitely in the driveway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, it was Buttermilk. Okay. Mm hmm Nice. You progressed pretty quickly from the driveway to, uh, what is it, uh, Panda Peak and yeah, the lower Panda slopes Peak. of Buttermilk? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And um, you were a, a member of the Aspen Valley Ski Club. Mm -hmm. And what were some of those kind of, um, I guess, highlights from, you know, being an ABS ski, ABSC member, you know, ski team member? Yeah, I mean, I went through pretty much every single program that they had up until team two and i oh there's so many memories i don't even know where to begin um but the whole experience was just amazing i think probably learning my first 360 was one of the like good memories and then also like being able to ski with uh another girl who was in the park a while ago Sadly, not any longer. Um, but being able to have her there and just kind of seeing, like, oh, there's other girls in the valley that are doing this definitely helped to get me where I am. Who today. is that person? Uh, Carson Campisi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So having, having that role model there, mm -hmm. obviously all the coaching support, all the competitions. Is there a competition that stands out in your mind, like from AVSC, <laughs> that would kind of springboard you into... You know, I don't even know. Probably just USASA Nationals. We had that every year in the spring in like April. And okay. I mean, the coaches at AVSC were just amazing and still still are amazing and just always supporting. And yeah. It, it seems to almost be getting better and better as you see people like Tamara McKinney coming mm -hmm. on board, John O. McBride back, yeah. you know. I mean, these are like national level, you know, wor you know world-class coaching. Yeah. So that didn't hurt, you know, having no. that kind of ABSC background and yeah, exactly. having the local ski areas. And when did you first kind of become like a fan of X Games? And, you know, I mean, I imagine you were quite young and you're standing like literally at the pipe going, wow. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think I missed a single X Games <laughs> except for one, which was only because I was at Junior Worlds. But I still watched it online. Right, right. Yeah. So do you remember how old you were when you first I saw have, X Games? I have no idea. You were that young. Yeah. <laughs> like you were so young, you can't really remember. Yeah, but. exactly. Um, but I'd say pretty young. So do you remember guys like like Peter Olenek when he was going huge? I don't. You know, I don't think that I really watched the um, Big Air event because that's what he competed in was like the yeah. Big Air one hit counted. Right. Um, which I think I would do pretty good in. <laughs> <laughs> would you want to do bigger? I would love to. Okay. Not not the actual bigger, but bigger in the half pipe, I would love to. Okay, okay. Um, well, you're known basically for your big air, for mm -hmm. your amplitude, as it's called. And I, I guess what I'd ask is two things. is How do you do that like mentally, set yourself up 
to go big, and then how do you do it physically? Because for me as a spectator and, you know, and a, as an athlete you know, in different sports, is it about kind of just you know, focusing in mentally and then just taking a lot of speed? Or you know, what else is there going on like in your mind and then kind of physically to set up to go 16 to 18 feet above the, above the pipe? All right, so I don't really realize that I'm going that big. <laughs> so I'd say just, like, progress over the years and slowly, like, taking an extra step up every once in a while and just slowly building that height and then skating in and taking a lot of speed in. So I wouldn't say, like, really anything mentally, but I can, I can tell you when I drop in, I drop in and I like can feel the transition and I'm just like really trying to just hold on. <laughs> and then once I'm in there, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so that progression, just yeah. going bigger and bigger and bigger mm -hmm. over time, gives you kind of a mental uh, confidence, kind of yeah. almost like you're, and you're not super nervous because you've done the work, you've gone higher and higher. So it's not like super scary, but I mean, it has to be some level of fear, right? In, yeah. in that mix, and how do you kind of manage the fear part of it? <laughs> you just, just focus more on the fun, or how do yeah, you <laughs> really just focus more on the fun? I mean, at a certain point, you trust yourself because you've yeah. done it so much. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not really sure how to really haven't really experienced anything where I'm like terrified of fear during competition. At least, I mean, always when you try your the new trick for the first time it's definitely scary but right. eventually you just kind of figure it out and you go well I'm doing good enough on the airbag and I should be good so <laughs> we'll just hope for the best because <laughs> <laughs> like in the off season or basically summer and fall you're working in an airbag mm -hmm. to practice these tricks right so that's, yeah. that's pretty critical that process in the airbag right yeah, well, first we go from, like, a trampoline, and then after the trampoline, once we learn that trick, okay. then we go to the airbag, and then okay. once we get it good enough on the airbag, then we go to um, the snow. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I like to use that word progression. It's all about just click, 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 click. Exactly. Really smart. Try to be as safe as possible. All right, Hannah, well, we got a lot to get to, including the Beijing Olympics, and who's this guy, Bing Dwen Dwen. <laughs> so, but first, got to take our only break of the show, guys. We're only going to be gone for about two minutes. All right, like I said, our only break of the show. We do want to thank our underwriters for making this series happen, including Gonzo Nation, Haiti Children, Klug Properties, Highlands Ale House, Obermeyer, Sundog Athletics, and Picking County Landfill. I do want to thank these underwriters again for making these kinds of shows with Hannah Fallhaber happen. Uh, so, guys, we're going to be right back with Hannah. Don't go away. The Gonzo Foundation is a nonprofit organization created to promote literature, journalism, and political activism through the legacy of Hunter S. Thompson and is a proud supporter of the local show and Grassroots TV. For more information, visit thegonzofoundation.org. I'm so passionate about this community. I absolutely love living here and raising my family here. It gives me a lot of pride to share this with my friends and my clients and help them achieve their, their dreams of owning an Aspen Snowmass and enjoying this incredible lifestyle. I'm Klaus Obermeier, and I wish you a terrific winter on the Aspen Mountains. Yo lo lo di 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 di
Yoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo
go to Copper and get some training in before heading on over. And okay. Which was a little weird. It kind of felt like it was going on, and it kind of felt like we weren't going to go in a sense. <laughs> it, we Just none of us were really in the Olympic spirit that like we were going. Um, but then once we finally got there, it was just oh, mind-blowing, just such an amazing experience. We... <laughs> We had like a six hour bus ride to get to the um, village and we had our COVID test and everything. And then we had to stay in our room till we got our COVID test back. Oh, but then to battle the <laughs> kind of time change and everything, we decided to like literally the first hour we were there, we decided to leave and go watch um, snowboard half pipe final. Oh, neat. Which was just such an amazing event to just kind of kick it off and it just that's when I was like oh I'm here <laughs> I'm at the Olympics <laughs> <laughs> when the reality finally s yeah, sank exactly. in this is actually happening yeah. that's amazing and, and you became friends with Haley Swerble who was there racing mm -hmm. another local we featured her uh you know hosted her here on the local show and but you had not really known Haley very well she's racing cross-country skiing yeah. Um, you guys kind of got to know each other at the Olympics a little bit? Yeah, I think before Olympics, we had kind of, like, replied to our Instagram stories or whatever before. Okay, um, kind of connected. Yeah, a little bit. Not not really. Um, and then it was a really last-minute thing, but I think it was, like, the second or third day I was – I think it was the second. Um, and – I was like walking to go to the dining hall and get lunch and I walked out to the courtyard and I knew that she was racing that day and I saw somebody with the LL Bean um, logo on their jacket and that's the cross country uh, sponsor and I was like, excuse me, <laughs> do you know where the cross country event is happening? She's like, yeah, I'm actually going. And I was like, uh, do you mind if I, like, tag along? No way. <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, okay, when are we leaving? She was 10 minutes. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I ran back to my apartment, and s instead of going and getting the food from the dining hall, I opted for microwave mac and cheese because <laughs> such an athlete um, <laughs> and so I quickly ate and got changed into something warmer and then went and watched her and I remember she it was a relay and she was first up to go That's and right. she had finished her friend or teammates hadn't finished yet um, but she came and walked over and she kind of I said hi Haley and like shouted it out she looked at me and then, like, looked back and then was like, wait, and came over and said hi. And that was literally the first time meeting in person. And wow. then she's like, I got to go get on some clothes. I'm quite cold. <laughs> <laughs> what was that interaction like with your own uh, free skiing team? Was there two or three other women mm -hmm. on the U.S. free skiing team? What was that, like, relationship like with, with those ladies? I mean, I've been traveling with them for the whole season and past seasons as well um but I've definitely gotten to know them quite well so I wouldn't say it necessarily changed at the Olympics it was quite emotional though because I mean it's not really confirmed but I have a feeling that both Britta and Devin will be done which is kind of sad to see because they inspired me to be where I am and just Britta kind of explained it as her handing the torch off to me. And I was like, oh, <laughs> thank you. And she's you. retiring then, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's, so you're pretty close friends, it sounds like, mm -hmm. with those ladies. And they also yeah. inspired you along the way. Yeah. I mean, we live in the same house for right. a couple, four months, five months throughout the year. So I'd say we'd become pretty close. <laughs> you yeah. either become really close or, or really like not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But close. So that's really awesome. And then the competition itself, uh, where you'd end up finishing sixth, correct? Mm -hmm. In women's ski half pipe. What was that like? Like when you're lining up for, you know, your first, I guess it was qualifiers. You have to qualify at first. Yeah. And kind of just can you take us briefly through that kind of that process and that kind of competition experience? Yeah, for sure. Um, all throughout qualifiers, I just 
could not wipe this smile off my face. <laughs> I was having the best time of my life. Awesome. Um, and I hear a lot of people saying that they don't really like qualifiers because it's like really nerve wracking because you have to make it on to the finals. And I think I just wasn't really thinking of that and then didn't really have that pressure on me and just was having such a fun day. It was almost like it was just another training day. <laughs> um, and then the next day for finals, it was really, really windy. And all throughout practice, I couldn't, I couldn't do my last hit, which is where I put the 900, which is my biggest trick, which I oh, <laughs> really need to do. Yeah, no <laughs> um, kidding. And I couldn't put it in because I couldn't even make it out of the pipe on my last hit because the oh, wind was like barreling in <laughs> the flat bottom and you just like feel it against you and just completely slow you down. So you could have like a 10 foot air that hit and just go maybe, maybe a foot out. Oh, jeez. Um, wow. And then I also took a pretty heavy crash during practice and I think that's when I just cracked and I was crying all throughout practice. And it, yeah, it was not a blast. Um, but I basically went up to my coaches and I was like, I can't, I can't talk to you. I'm just going to go through and do a fun lap. And I got I got to find myself again. So I stopped crying. <laughs> just give me a sec. <laughs> to regroup. Yeah. Basically. And then I came back up and I did a fun lap and I felt a little better. And then I went for one more lap and just kind of didn't do the nine, but at least did a five at the bottom. Um, and then it luckily started to clear up for the competition. But yeah, it was wow. It was a battle. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Like what a process right there that mm -hmm. you have to go through. And then just mentally holding it together, you know, regrouping. I'm good. I'm fine. But yeah. recovering from those crashes, that's got to be challenging. You know, I mean, the pain, the physical pain, but then just, again, the psychology of it all. So there's a big mental game going on, right? Yeah, for sure. Right. But you learn some tricks, right? It's, you learn some tools to use, it sounds like. Yeah, I will really help 100% you. take the what I learned from this past experience of kind of cracking under pressure and to kind of learn from that and take it into the next Olympics or even the next competitions. What were some other lessons that you, you know, you brought out of this Olympics? <laughs> Just in terms of, I guess, competing, you know, and um, maybe even the Olympic experience itself. Well, what were some of those major lessons, that kind of takeaways? That's a good question. Um, I think that I will definitely, well, so all throughout the season, I was doing pretty good, and I didn't necessarily put pressure on myself or like expectations on myself, um, but at the same time I did. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, I was doing this good throughout the season. I should be able to possibly match that and possibly podium, I don't know. And then when I cracked, I was like, oh, that's not gonna happen. And that just kind of made it even <laughs> worse. Um, so probably just, not putting as much pressure on myself and really trying to just have no expectations and just go and have a fun time. Right. Isn't it a lot about the fun? Because I think, I mean, as an athlete myself, when I set myself up that way, you know, with my psychology, like, hey, I'm just going to go have fun. I, my body will do what it's trained to do, right? You almost go into an autopilot. But if you can frame it by having fun, then you kind of relax, right? And when we yeah. relax, we usually perform better mm -hmm. than when we're like, tight, tensing, putting all the pressure and expectation. So it's kind of back to the fun, right? Yeah. When you were a two-and-a-half-year-old in the driveway, yeah. <laughs> in one sense, right? Yeah, if you can, like, convince yourself that you're having fun, you're going to yeah. perform the best that you ever have, I'd say. Right, right. Or at least that's when I've performed my best is when I'm having fun. So. so now that you've arrived, Hannah, so to speak, what would be advice for little girls looking up at you it's also probably a weird concept. <laughs> like now you're that girl, yeah. that role model. But what would be a couple tips, I guess, just for young aspiring athletes? You know, whether they're, you know, in the ski super, you know, ski half pipe or super pipe, or in other, you know, kind of athletics. What would be maybe a couple pointers? Yeah, um, I actually went into the 
basalt elementary school and middle school and high school nice the other day um to kind of talk to them and kind of sign autographs take pictures whatever and some things that i was saying first have fun because that's as we were just saying most important thing and also i mean when i was their age i had the dream of going to x games going to the olympics and it just goes to show that dreams do come true so if you have a dream and something that you want definitely go after it and keep pursuing it because you never know it might it might come true so <laughs> i love that yeah. i love that yeah i mean it, it, if we follow our dreams if we live from our passion you know we're we're motivated right we'll we'll work through the challenges but when we're doing something we're not we don't love as much you know we're obviously not as motivated if we're doing it for someone else or whatever you know but if we're doing it for ourselves it just seems like it's just such a more powerful avenue in our last you know, minute to share, Hannah, any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our viewers? Just kind of general life philosophy or anything else that you'd like to share before we, we head out know. for today? You brought up Bing Dwen Dwen and he's just- Oh yeah, wait mind. a minute, yeah. <laughs> what about that Bing Dwen Dwen? He's the cutest little mascot ever. And <laughs> oh, it was, <laughs> he, there's like, compilations of him on TikTok of him like face planning and it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny um and also uh going to buy the little mascot was so hard I heard they were he really hard to come by. He was a very hot commodity yeah he's like that little circular little guy yeah yeah <laughs> and he's he's adorable I managed to get one so you got one yeah I got one okay and then I got a little one that they every athlete got um I got one, and I got the Bing Dwen Dwen pillow dash blanket thing. Oh man, three of them. So, oh yeah. dude, I, I got. <laughs> I got you and I have to talk. Uh, a little uh, big Bing Bing Dwen Dwen. Now who's Zhu? Z H U. Uh, who's Zhu? Julie Ron Ron. That's the. Okay. Um, I saw I saw that per, that person or entity referred to on on your Instagram. Yeah, that's the Paralympic. Oh, Zhu. Oh, Zhu. Yeah. Oh, the volunteer. Oh, Zoo's a volunteer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's, it was super meaning. Oh, there's a whole story behind but it. But she was one of the Chinese volunteers yeah. at the Olympics. They were all um, college students. So, okay. oh, so cute. People can find out more on your Instagram. Yeah, for did, sure. Did you have fun on the show today? Yeah. I wish we had more time. I want to elaborate on that, but we'll have to have you back. Yeah. I did bake you some sure. cookies, Hannah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. And thank you also for uh, representing our community and the athletic community. And thank you for sharing the couch with Luna. <laughs> <laughs> Any day. And we want to thank your mom who's in our live audience too, Belinda, and the whole, the whole Fallhaber clan. Yeah. So thank you once again. And thank you guys for watching us this week on a special Olympic edition of The Local Show. The Gonzo Foundation is a nonprofit organization created to promote literature, journalism, and political activism through the legacy of Hunter S. Thompson and is a proud supporter of the local show and Grassroots TV. For more information, visit thegonzofoundation.org. I'm so passionate about this community. I absolutely love living here and raising my family here. It gives me a lot of pride to share this with my friends and my clients and help them achieve their, their dreams of owning an Aspen Snowmass and enjoying this incredible lifestyle. Sundog Athletics, Aspen's Adventure Sports School, is your opportunity to experience private, all-inclusive snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, and fat biking instructional adventures that will improve your safety, performance, and enjoyment.